Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome aboard, folks. This is Dr. Charles Parker, and we have uh, an interesting discussion today. It's all about disabilities. I mean, do we have people out there who have some disabilities, who are frustrated with where they're able to put their act together with their work, their home, and, and how they handle disabilities? Well, our person today, Dr. Richard Cherney, is going to tell us all about it. And he has his associate, his colleague, Jamie Love on board. Welcome, guys. Thanks for coming on board. Oh, my goodness. It's so fun and happy. we're so happy to be here. Thank you for having us. All right, so here we go. Let me introduce you guys, and then we'll talk a little bit about your journey so we can then get the background. And we're going to talk about this whole critical issue of the field of disabilities, where we can go with it. So Dr. Richard Cherney is a clinical psychologist and a certified rehabilitation counselor with over 20 years experience in the field of disabilities. Here is the kicker, folks. He is a gentleman who suffers with cerebral palsy, and he has overcome many obstacles with his disability over a lifetime, so that makes him a personal expert as well as a practice expert. So he does this work with disabilities by changing attitudes about themselves. He is also a Shriner clown. He entertains children with orthopedic disabilities and burns at the Shriner Hospitals in Boston and Philadelphia. And he's written a memoir, The Little Engine That Did It. It reflects on how his disability empowered him to achieve the goals in his life. His life's purpose, folks, is to empower people, both people with disabilities and those without, so that they can achieve their own life goals and realize, hey, we're all the same. So he currently lives up in Long Island, New York. And as I mentioned, his partner is Jamie Love. So we're going to hear about them. Hey, guys, fill in some of the personal details of your life, if you will, so we get to know you a little bit better. Well, Jamie, why don't you go first? And then I'll just segue in there. Well... Richard, as you said, is a, a Shriner clown, so that means that he's a Shriner. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's the reason why we got to meet each other. We had the privilege and opportunity to meet one another is because I was a bartender at one of the Shriner events that he was attending. And uh, I actually knew about him because I started this, this job back in uh, May of 2012. And I heard about him from one of the new members that was coming into the group. And he told me, I had told him that I love working with people with disabilities. That's one of my passions in life, you know. And he had said, wow, you know, I have this friend of mine. He's a doctor and he has a disability. I I don't really know what it's called, but he he definitely does have a disability. And, And I don't know what kind of doctor he is either. But I said, well, give him my phone number. And, uh. Dr. Richard did not call me for quite some time. But Richard, I yeah, want you to true. tell them the rest of the story and why you didn't call me. Why didn't you call okay. her, Richard? Well, why didn't I call her? Because I got to the last digit of my of her phone number, Chuck. Yeah. And I would hang up the phone because these little thoughts in my head and the monkey mind, as I call it, if you want to coin a phrase, said, ah, she's not going to be interested in you. So I, I would hang up the phone. <laughs> yep. And I remember that day when the uh, weekend was going to start. It was September 17th. And I had just finished my galley proofs for my book, the final edit. And I was real tired because I'd been working on Skype with my editor, Anita Misra Press. Uh, who lives in Portland, and I really didn't feel like going. And then I heard this voice in my head saying, you better go, Richard. My intuition was talking to me. Mm -hmm. This weekend is going to change your life. Oh. So 
I went. That's interesting. And I was rolling into the hospitality suite, and there was this beautiful blonde that I saw out of the right corner of my eye. And she was coming towards me in the scooter. And I stopped my scooter. And she bent down and said, Hey, scooter, how <laughs> are you doing? <laughs> True love right there. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm going like, up, 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 up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> because usually, you know, when a pretty woman was in the room, I was like, oh, my God, maybe this is my chance. If they show some interest, I may get, get the first base. Mm -hmm. And with this woman that was leaning over my handlebars, I figured that this was going to be a reality. And it kind of happened that way. Now, that's great. Now, let me, let me interrupt and ask you a question. Now, you let's get the picture for our audience because... Uh, I can't see you right now because you're on the phone connection. But uh, are, tell us about your disability. Are you're in a you're in a scooter, and you've been in a scooter. How yeah. long have you been in a scooter? Well, I use the scooter, Chuck, uh, when I have to walk a long way, uh, and you know I, I use a scooter sometimes a wheelchair, mm -hmm. and uh, I walk with crutches and a cane. So I, I use a, a cane most of the time. Some sometimes crutches. Uh, a scooter and a wheelchair, depending on where I'm going and the terrain. Well, the uh, next the next you know, question that comes up there is how do you do that as a clown? I mean, immediately we go no, from I, I, your meeting to being a clown with a Shriner clown, and you're you have a handicap. You've got a disability going on. How do you manage all that? Yeah. Well, uh, I use that disability to my advantage, uh, and I, I usually clown in a wheelchair. And it's amazing when you're clowning in a wheelchair because kids love clowns and they come up to me and, you know, they want me to do balloon animals and I'm not really good at it, but I do the best I can. I try and make a dog, but it turns out to be a frankfurter because <laughs> it doesn't hold the shape. <laughs> but there you go. So you're doing, so anyway, you're doing the balloon twisting thing going on and you're yeah, doing it in the wheelchair. And I have a magic bag and I, I pull out handkerchiefs out of the bag and now I know how that works and it's really brilliant. Very uh, interesting. And, but kids respond, to, kids respond to me being a clown and sometimes I, you know, I'm the coordinator of the transportation unit for the Roadrunners and we transport the kids from Philadelphia to Philadelphia and Boston uh, from Long Island and sometimes I show up in the hospital in my wheelchair and the kids come up to me and they say, wow, what's the matter with you? And I tell them all, I'm just like you, but I'm bigger. <laughs> and then the mothers and the fathers come over and they say, you really have CP? And I say, yes. And I, I wrote a book and they say, oh, let me get that book. I want to write it down because I, I wrote it for parents with kids with disabilities because when you have a child that has a disability, you, you're really afraid in the beginning. You don't know what's going to happen. So that's why I wrote the memoir. That was one, one of my other driving forces to give them hope. And to say, hey, listen, they have a disability, but they're still capable of doing things in life and achieving things. And I'm proof positive of that. So I would have to say that in terms of how I help people, I'm the first example, Chuck. Very you know, interesting. And then I wait for them to uh, approach me. And then we build a bridge of understanding that way. And... The interesting thing about that is Jamie helps me with that, too, because before I met Jamie, I was an academic and I just studied. And that's how I focused my energy to just study and achieve so I could become a bridge builder later on. So I'm a man of letters. Uh, and when she came into the picture, she she brought color to it. And I'll tell you an interesting phenomenon that happens. When I'm out in public, people look at me and I know they want to ask me questions. And I will, I will answer those questions if they approach me and then we build a bridge for understanding. But when Jamie and I are in public, either we're walking down the street and I'm holding onto her arm or she's pushing me in the wheelchair, those same individuals will come up to me and the men will give me a high five and and the women sometimes will take pictures of us and they'll say, oh, you're such a cute couple. So it's really interesting about how people make attributions and perceptions are different when uh, people are together as opposed to being apart. And I feel that people with disabilities are hidden in plain sight. Uh, say what, people say what, with disabilities mm -hmm. 
they're hidden in plain sight. You see them, but you don't really, really, uh, you see them, but you don't see us. You see us, but you don't see us. Because it's very hard for you to, to see people with disabilities because it might bring up a flaw inside of you and, and, and bring up an inadequacy that you have. But if you approach us and start a dialogue, then we build a bridge to understanding from both sides. So that's why I'm very open in terms of being accessible to people if they ask me questions and why I wrote the book, because I want to assist people in a greater understanding that we're all the same. And that's Jamie and, our, and my mission in life. That's our mission about spreading the love. And we do a show on Journey into Awareness on Block Talk Radio. And uh, our theme song is The Love Train because we all want to get aboard The Love Train and spread the love. Because that's how the world changes. One person at a time, one step at a time, and through the power of love. Love of self and love of each other. It sounds beautiful. Let me ask you a quick question just so people can connect with you. The Journey into Awareness and Blog Talk Radio do you have Blog Talk Radio podcast then at the jo Journey into Awareness, or is that how you actually you put the two together? Yes, that's yeah. correct. That's correct. We're we're on Blog Talk Radio, but our the name of our program is Journey into Awareness with Dr. Richard Cherney and Jamie Love. Gotcha. So then, what do you actually? do uh, in terms of, I, I've got the, the clown thing, and I have that picture. It's a, an evocative picture. We can, we can see that happening, and you can see how Jamie would help you with uh, starting the conversation. Do you actually practice psychology? Do you do counseling as well, or is it mainly uh, this, this whole situation of being available for kids in, in the hospital setting? Well, I, I, uh, to that end, I have uh, launched a website, and I'm going to be doing Internet counseling, and uh, anybody can find me on journeyintoawareness.com. Uh, and I feel that this is the new wave of the future, Chuck, doing counseling via the Internet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, we are also building our message through the social media through mm -hmm. our Facebook fan page, through Blog Talk Radio, and through the book. Uh, I didn't really work in a clinic when I got my license because I have difficulties doing intakes uh, the way they want to do them through the, uh, the Department of uh, the Office of Mental Health and OASIS. Uh, I have processing problems, so I couldn't really work in, at that pace. So that's why I never got a job at an intake, uh, doing intakes in a clinic. But I feel that my skills are very well suited for counseling psychology. And to that end, I'm, I'm uh, putting that out there. So then what do you... Working for myself. Do you have a system when someone calls you and you're talking to somebody in Poughkeepsie, whatever, and yes. do you have a protocol, a structure for working with them? regarding here's where you are now, here's where you need to go next, here's the way you can actually transform your life. Do you have a, a process that would uh, perhaps be able to be shared? Absolutely, yes. Uh, I uh, was bitten by the existential bug when I was going to school, and that's how really I approach uh, dealing with a client. Uh, because everybody is coming to us, the helpers, because they're searching for meaning about themselves. So that's my first task, to help them to search for meaning. And how do you do that? You do that first by connecting and building a rapport. And then you throw a little bit of Albert Ellis in there and some of uh, Fritz Perl's techniques, and you have a nice, and then you add some of yourself and oh. your own life experiences. And then you have a nice recipe for a cake all right, well, let me interrupt it in Rizzo the oven and, and bake it. <laughs> what did you say? Who? Yes, that's right. I, I said, don't forget Rizzo, Rizzo and Hudson. Hudson. All right, let's, let's run yeah, the tape yeah. back a little bit. Let's, let, a lot of our audience don't know these, these players. So we know okay. 
you know, we know Albert Ellis. Let's talk about Albert Ellis, Fritz Perls. Let's just break them down in a couple of sentences. Sure. Well, uh, they both uh, deal with the here and now of the individual, and they, they're looking at a person's behavior in terms of what is working, what is a maladaptive behavior for you. And, and it first begins with a thought. So that's how the, you're going to approach the person. Okay, what are you thinking about? And the amazing thing about thoughts is if you think, if you pay attention to your negative thoughts, all of a sudden everything in front of you starts to become negative. So that's what Ellis and Pearls talk about mm -hmm. in terms of reintegrating yourself so that you can feel more in control of your life. And then this other that explanation, Chuck. Yes, yeah, rational emotive therapy. And then now, what was this other person? I don't know this other person. I, I met Albert Ellis a long time ago, but uh, who was this third person that Jamie brought up? Well, it's oh, two Jamie people is actually. A, it's Rizzo yes. and Hudson, and they are the authors of the Enneagram. And that's, a, that's basically a nine-point personality uh, acknowledgement that there's about nine, pe nine types of people with certain personalities. It's, it's kind of like astrology in, in a lot of ways. It comes from ancient Sufi um, philosophy. And uh, it's actually quite beautiful, but it, it categorizes people in their in their dominant personality for instance you have like the reformer somebody that wants to come in and change other people and it's maybe you might call them a control freak you know mm -hmm. and then you've got the helper which is you know if you're going astrologically that might be a cancer somebody that's that's very uh, loving, nurturing. Somebody wants to get in there and help all the time. You know, you have the achiever and so forth. So, you know, these I, I really like to go um, the gestalt, holistic uh, approach. with. And Richard and I, we want to do uh, couples therapy as well. Mm -hmm. So what are the difficulties you've had as you go along this? What would you say would be a a moment where you hit a wall and you had a aha experience and you're like, oh my gosh, I've got to really, I've got to evolve this situation, make it different and uh, come up with a different way of approaching. What would be a learning experience you've had in that regard? In terms of resistance from a client? Yeah. Or, or actually okay. just you moving your work forward in some way. Well, I think from my own perspective, you have to be able to identify your own resistance. And then once you identify your own resistance, you could also uh, see that in other people that you're working with. Uh, and my big Achilles heel is procrastination. And I know when I procrastinate more often, I'm getting closer to a shift in my uh, life. So... I would have to say that when you experience resistance from a client, uh, you have to find yourself in them and then you're able through some type of self-disclosure to assist them in that way. So you're turning a negative into uh, an opportunity. This is where it's going to happen. Something's going to happen now. Exactly, yes. And then you, that, that then is a relief to them because then they don't have to feel uh, the negative experience. It can become constructive and they can use it and move on past it. Right. And you, you're, you're basically joining them in their resistance and then they don't feel like they're all alone uh, battling with themselves. Uh, you're, you're, and through empathy and understanding, you're getting them to experience another level of awareness. Well, now, how do you deal with That's disabilities what therapy is about. besides the therapy and that kind of very personal, helpful, here's how you evolve as a human being? Are there any tricks that you've come up with in terms of how to help a person cope 
with the real world in practical terms, like, like you're in a wheelchair. Do you work with them with specific disabilities, perhaps? Uh, well, I haven't worked with a specific disability necessarily, but I have worked with, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the old, all the problems that we have in terms of low self-esteem and uh, other issues of that nature. Yeah. Uh, coming from an overprotective uh, environment with my parents and them not letting, letting me fly necessarily because of fear. So I can really identify how anxiety, you know, which is basically a neurochemical reaction that gets translated into an emotional mood, uh, can be very overwhelming for an individual and stop them from moving ahead. So what you have to do is you have to break it down uh, into smaller and smaller steps. And I remember being in therapy myself for 18 years and really understanding, uh, you know, what I learned from my psychoanalyst. He was a modern psychoanalyst. And Stephen would always say to me, be scared and do it anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's what, how I work with people when they come to see me or when I'm doing a lecture. I always uh, reinforce the point that, yes, you know, things are scary, but you're not going to negotiate them unless you conquer that fear. So be scared and do it anyway. That's what I would say, Chuck. So you have to go into that new reality. Instead of not going into yeah. the reality, you have to go in the reality. The only way you get any mastery is to actually enter the reality and cope with it. Correct. Yes. A zen, a zen it. moment. You're, ta you're, you're actually talking about existentialism, but it has a certain... Zen quality to it as well. Correct. And I am a meditator and so is Jamie. We both meditate on a regular basis and we, and I think it's real important and we both have a spiritual practice too, the two of us. And I think that's also a very important component about good mental health. You have to have some kind of, kind of spiritual practice. Let's, let's talk about on. that. I totally agree with you. Let's, let's take a moment to talk about how you introduce that in your practice as part of your practice because I think people would be interested in that. It's a touchy subject. I mean, you know, you may have a Catholic person or a Jewish person or whatever and they're, they're in a certain line of chain of command, as it were. How do you actually introduce a spiritual practice to a person who has a denominational bent? Well, that's totally Amy, would easy. You like Yes, I that's, was going to say, you feel that question, yeah. Me, yes. me, me. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie's going to answer it. Well, um, I have a very uh, eclectic background of spirituality. I started out as a Lutheran. I, I was a born-again Christian. I uh, went from born-again Christian to Baha'i. And when you're a Baha'i, they encourage you to learn about uh, at least 10 other books of writings or philosophies. So I did. I, I, I went that, that path and I, I dealt. And you know what? Every philosophy has their own ritual. They have their own uh, way of meditation, prayer. It's all pretty much the same thing, just different words, you know? And so it's, it's, it's really important to learn those languages, even if it's just a little bit. You want to learn about Muslim. You want to learn about their, you know, how they wash five times a day and how they pray several times a day. And you want to learn about even even people that are more esoteric, the people that, you know, uh, meditate or, or pull a tarot card for themselves every day. You want to you want to find out what is your spiritual practice? Do you have one? What do you prefer? You know, you do have to be sensitive to those things. You can't just say, hey, you know, um, Catholic person, why don't you just go meditate? That's really insensitive. You wouldn't want to do that. You'd want to say, you know, pull out your rosary beads and, you know, take, take that moment, you know, to quiet your mind. The whole point is to quiet your mind. <coughs> and to transition yes. them into transcending reality by having a spiritual practice of some kind. And if That's they true. don't, 
If they don't, then we can talk about breath. Okay, let's talk about that for a moment. Say, that's a great segue, the power of the breath, Chuck. Uh, I worked with Dr. Gil Pfeiffer, and he was my Merlin incarnate. And he would always say, you want to get it to awareness? The power of the breath will get you there. So I learned about breathing. And what I do now on a regular basis for about an hour a day is I do pranayama breathing and... Uh, Asana breathing. Okay, take a moment to tell us what those are. Those are those are important things. Yes, please. Yes, pranayama breathing, because you don't breathe through your nose uh, on an equal basis. You you you, exchange, you change off. You go from your right to your left nostril. The mm -hmm. so pranayama breathing is where you pinch one nostril, and then you hold it for ten seconds, and then you breathe out the other one, and you alternate back and forth. And I do that for 25 minutes. And then after that's finished, I do what's called asana breathing. And that's where I'm sitting with my back to a chair. Both of these are done to a chair and your, your feet are planted on the floor and you're, you're sitting at a 90 degree angle and you're, you're, you're with asana breathing, you're resting your, your hands on your thighs and you're breathing through your uh, nose and out, you're breathing in and out of your nose, and you're quieting your mind as you're doing this, and you're focusing on your inner self, you're focusing on your breath, you're trying very hard in both of these practices not to pay attention to your thoughts, and you want to quiet them down. I kind of visualize uh, a high tide and all these waves going against the breakers, and as I'm doing this breathing, they're just calming down, calming down. These waves are calming down till the water is like glass. And then eventually your thoughts become that way too. And it's pretty interesting what happens phenomenologically when you do this practice, because you can actually, uh, you know, get to different types of visualizations of what's in front of you. Uh, sometimes the, the uh, room loses focus, and I feel like I'm floating as I'm doing these two practices. So the power of the breath is very, very important, and lots of uh, great scholars have written about this. Uh, Stanislav Graf wrote a book called Holotropic Breathing out of his practice uh, when he first started out uh, in the uh, New Age psychology, uh, transpersonal movement, and John Kabat-Zinn has written some great books about breathing, and uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, who was the Tibetan, Vietnam, the uh, Vietnamese monk, has written the books about stillness and about breathing and meditation, to name a few. Well, that's great. I, in fact, as you were going, I was writing vigorously to try to write them down for the show notes. You know, I'd love it if you guys would send us a note so I could get them in the show notes. I think those are all, in fact, that's what I was going to uh, really ask you about is as you started talking about breathing it's a dimension that would help a person deal with uh, impediments uh, in facing changing reality I mean changing reality is the thing we all have to deal with whether you're disabled or not which you you made clear early on uh, but individuals this yeah. with disability have a harder time because in their mind they can't make it and then what has to shift is it doesn't matter the disability, it really matters the mindset as you're approaching uh, changing reality. And, and then how to exactly. approach it from an inner calm and a sense of internal self-confidence with a transcendent attitude that, this, that things are bigger than this, that you can actually get past it smaller. It's not, it's not uh, you know, the Hoover Dam. It's, uh, it's no. a speed bump in the road of life. Exactly. Yes. Don't you agree, Jamie? Absolutely. I, I couldn't have said it better myself. I've actually used the speed bump term all the time. I said, oh, it's a bump on a road. Mm -hmm. you don't, 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 don't worry about it. It's over. That was so 10 minutes ago. <laughs> and what's your favorite saying, Jamie, that you always say to me? Oh, there's so many, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Please. I'm always telling you something. Pass. 
This too shall pass. This too shall pass. I love that one, yes. Well, I think that's a very good one because, you know, from my experience, what we're dealing with is changing reality and we're putting it in the context of time. So what happens yeah. is when you say this too shall pass, you're talking about the passage of time in one's lifetime. And so that's another reality than just the reality of whatever that concrete item is right there. This whole other reality of the passage of time does give a person a larger perspective because then you're in that transcendent mode because then your childhood, your adulthood, your age, where you're going, your life's mission becomes much more tangible when you're thinking about time or when you're facing the reality of time, as it were. Yes. I couldn't have said it better myself, Chuck. Well, listen, Richie, this is, uh, and Jamie, this is good. I mean, what I'd like you to do, I am mean, going to formally ask you to send those things to me because I'll put them in the show notes. This will be out uh, down the road about uh, six or seven weeks. And uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. You've actually taken a very difficult subject, which is what does a person do with a handicap, disability, whatever you want to call it, and then how do they actually deal with that personal challenge in confronting the changes in their lives? How do they actually change their lives in that context? And uh, one of the things, folks, that uh, has happened that, uh, that Richard and Jamie have offered is Richard's book, The Little Engine That Did It. It's going to be in a drawing, and that's CoreBrain, uh, Core if I can say it, CoreBrainJournal.com uh, forward slash 070 drawing and if you if you dial that in you'll be able to go in and get the drawing for about two weeks after this uh episode is published so that's right so is there anything closing guys that you would like to say hey there's one other thing as we're winding up here that i think is relevant to this whole subject that i'd like to just tell the listeners about before we go well i, I would say Go ahead, Jamie. She said she... No, go, Richard. <laughs> yeah, she's drawing a blank. <laughs> okay. I would say, remember what the Buddha said. The journey of 10,000 steps begins with the first step. So, you got to make that first step. What a great way. You'll be yeah. amazed at what you see when you keep stepping. Because there's a beautiful rainbow at the end of that road. Isn't there, Jamie? Or I'd like to say, just like Dory, just keep swimming, 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 just keep swimming. Now, what's that one? Now, you that's a reference. I couldn't quite hear what you were saying. Just like who? That's, that's from Finding Nemo and, oh. the, and the little blue fish that couldn't remember anything. Oh, okay. She sang a little song. And what do we do? We <laughs> swim. <laughs> so it's really the same thing. Only the it's one. The same yes. thing. Yeah. Just keep going. Don't stop and dwell on the negative. Just keep going. This too shall pass. So there's a theme in summer. Be scared, One is, do it anyway. Be scared, do it anyway. Face the reality. Accept the fact that time is an issue and that you can go ahead and get it done because you only have a limited amount of time. That's going to be a boot in the rear to get you to take it to the next step. And uh, really this whole thing about stepping and stepping into that new reality is an important point. Yes. So thank you very much, guys. I appreciate you coming on board. I think disabilities is a very frequently, how does one deal with a disability from a therapy, from a self-evolutionary point of view, is, is a big challenge. People don't talk about it. It's sort of like, let's just put that disability aside and go ahead and do what we're going to do. And I think this is very helpful to help people think, hey, I can handle this. I'm going to get real with myself on myself on this issue, as opposed to, uh, remaining in denial about it and, and sort of skipping over it and, and, you know, missing the point. So thank you very much, I guys. People, I want to encourage all the people that don't have disabilities to really think about having a relationship with somebody with a disability. And don't be afraid to have a conversation and I don't mean a, a, a romantic relationship. I just mean 
any relationship, a friendship, you know, because I, I when I met Richard, he was kind of lonely. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so think about that. I totally thank agree. Thank you so much for having us on, our, on your show, Chuck. Oh, oh thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. You know, you just encourage yeah, me. To, you know, Chuck, that's another that's a, that's a, that's another show, sexuality and disability. That you could have us on. For. That would be interesting. We got lots of stories about that too. We could definitely do that. We might get personal on that one. That's <laughs> yeah, okay. Absolutely. You know, uh, okay. some of the uh, two two yeah. people that I met in Philly when I was up in Philly, both were blind. They were a blind couple, and we had some wow. really interesting times, just uh, with. Uh, going to parties with them in Philadelphia with the two blind couple and uh, two blind people as a couple, and it was just a fantastic time. They were great. They were bright, and uh, they would bring poems and read poems. This was in the days of, you know, the hippie ge- hippie generation. They bring some poems in, and they were so the poems themselves took the entire audience into a different place. It's it's meditative in a certain way. It's transcendent. And it puts time in a certain context and puts their disability in a complete context. In very, very good. We definitely hear you, Chuck. And I just got one thing to say. Kitchen table. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a magic word. Go ahead and tell that one. Kitchen table. See, he's, he's talking to you, Jamie. He's not talking to us. <laughs> he's not talking to anybody else but me. I love you, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, too. All right. That will go, that will be the secret. Thank you. That will be the secret. Thank Thank you you very much, guys. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because, as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications like those written for ADHD, are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.